But without further ado, I'd like to kick off tonight's event. Uh, very excited to have uh, uh, two uh, subject experts. We got Sonia Tron Ayers, uh, who's uh, a Minnesota attorney, but also uh, real experience on uh, uh, growing up on a, a family farm and then all of a sudden being encountered uh, with confined animal uh, feeding operations um, popping up and, and, and hogs specifically. Uh, she'll tell you more about that in here in just a minute. And then also we have uh, uh, Frank James uh, from Dakota Rural Action and was talking with Frank yesterday. Frank's got 35 years in community organizing experience and has been the staff director of Dakota Rural Action for uh, several years now. So Frank, thanks for being with us tonight. And he's gonna present a more uh, uh, system uh, framework for uh, a campaign plan to um, fight against CAFOs, but really it's a valuable campaign strategy on a, a number of different issues you can plug in there. So uh, pretty exciting. I'll, I'll just want to remind everyone to please mute yourself if you're not a featured speaker. And uh, we'll uh, turn it over our speakers in, in just a moment. I'll ask my team, was there anything I failed to mention there before we get our presentation started? Anything my teammates would like to say? I will say, though, uh, let's do keep uh, the... A lot of questions I'm sure are going to pop in your mind. Uh, we'll take questions at the end unless you're asking for clarification, a term you didn't understand, or or just to clarify just uh, as a quick question. Uh, please put all your questions in the chat. You'll see the chat function uh, down at the bottom of your screen, and, uh, and we'll get those uh, uh, questions uh, collected and uh, ask our speakers uh, at the end of their presentation. We expect about, um, you know, roughly a, a 30 minute presentation. We'll go to questions uh, for Sonia who will start us out tonight. And then we'll take a, just a quick uh, quick break to refresh. And then we'll get to uh, Frank is the, is the game plan here. Um, so teammates, did you wanna chime in? Otherwise I'm gonna turn it over to Sonia without further ado. Okay, thanks Zach. Thank you, Sonia. Um, yeah. Well, I'm just thrilled that we have um, all of these national groups and just and the overwhelming support across state lines. And it's really uh, an inspiration and it's an indicator that we need change and that we want change, that we're all of a similar mind and and want this change. Sam, you want to go to the next slide? Here's my contact information. Uh, if you need to reach me, I'd prefer that you communicate through um, our Dodge County Concerned Citizens website. It's info at dodgecc.org. I'm easy to find. Um, I'm an attorney in Minneapolis, but please try and keep any communication. Uh, send it to this email if you would, please. And then next. Community organizing, and before I kind of jump in here, I want to talk just a moment about community organizing and why do we organize? And we organize, I think, for a number of reasons, to protect the communities we love, to protect our families, to protect our farms, and to protect the, the other places we love, like rivers and streams and, you know, trout streams, all those things and lakes that we love. And for me, um, there is a, a deep history. Our story, the Trom family farm, our story begins in 1892, over 130 years ago. My great grandfather emigrated from Norway with two relatives. My, my great grandfather's on the far right. His name was Ed Trom. And he uh, came to the United States with two relatives, those two relatives who are on the left in the it looks like they're coonskin, uh, but they're fur coats. I'm not quite sure what they are. And they settled in North Dakota. The next slide. My great grandfather was the chief architect of Little Westfield Lutheran Church. This church sits on the same mile square as our family farm. 
and the church has been refurbished um, thanks to the efforts of my parents, a number of family members, and also a number of relatives um, that helped to restore this church. They actually lifted it off its foundation, put a brand new foundation. There's new siding, brand new windows, stained glass windows. In fact, I attended church there on Sunday and there was standing room only. I mean, it's really, it was really exciting to see that kind of um, excitement and and just to be part of that community uh, last Sunday. Next. My great grandparents moved on to our family farm. This would be Ed's son, Elmer. Elmer moved on to our farm in 19, in 1925. So our farm has been in our family almost a hundred years. And um, my father, who is in this picture, he's just a little boy. This picture was taken in 1932. That's the farmhouse where I grew up. Uh, it's been remodeled, updated, and so forth. But that's a picture of my my father and two of his sisters that were taken in 1932. And you can see geese, you know, they had geese, they had hogs, they had everything, of course, because that's how the farms were back a hundred years ago. You had your own, you were self-sustaining. And so, um, you know, these are the places we love. These are the people we love. And I have a very large family. My dad was one of 10 children and all, Eight of the 10 were born in that house. Next slide. This is our farm today. And uh, you can see that uh, we have a long driveway and I walked that driveway hundreds and hundreds of times. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there was something very special about growing up on the family farm. And, you know, as I look at that photo, for me, I see there are lots of memories, running to catch the bus, getting off the bus when my younger brother was born, hoping I could beat my other, you know, there were six children in my family and, you know, hoping I could beat the other siblings up the driveway because I knew that that brand new baby was coming home that day, only to realize that they also knew the same thing and we all ran as fast as we could up that driveway. Um, but there's also special things, you know, as I look, at the farm, I think, as I sit here today, I think about the dozens of cars that would populate the, um, the farmyard because we've had a lot of family events, lots of family reunions. I have dozens, almost, I have 44 first cousins on my Trom side. And so we'd have large family reunions. My husband and I had our wedding reception there. We had high school graduation parties, lots of family events. and. There's something very special about growing up on the family farm. All right. That is, um, oops, you want to go back for just a moment? And growing up on the same places where my grandparents, my parents, and other family members, the place that we all call home. And there's also something very special about walking the land that prior generations walked. Next. And for many of us on this call today, we realize the fundamental change that has been occurring for years in rural areas with the introduction of corporate factory farms. Here's a photo of a factory farm situated one mile north of our farm. The first building was put up in 1993. The second was not put up in 1998. There are an estimated 4,000 hogs on this location on just a few acres of land. And the farmer who put this up was the son of a Farm Bureau member. I don't think that there's any surprise to most of the people on this call that a lot of these facilities were put up by the sons and children of Farm Bureau members. Next. In 2013, 
10 years ago, my mother entered the local nursing home. My mother had uh, advanced Parkinson's for many years. My mother suffered for many years and just died actually a couple of months ago. And just a few months after she entered the nursing home, my father received notice that yet another swine factory farm was going into the area. This one just a half mile west of our farm. And here's a photo of that factory farm that exists today. So in 2014, with my parents in the nursing home, they initiated the first of three lawsuits against um, Dodge County officials and also the swine industry. And um, they were gonna fight. My father said, enough is enough. And they initiated legal action. We have 12 swine CAFOs in a three mile radius of our farm, 12, just imagine. And you can see them clearly right now. I mean, I stand at our farm when I emerge from the, the building spot and you can see a number of these swine CAFOs right from our, right from our driveway. But our family's not alone. Uh, the industry has forced a number of these factory farms into rural areas across the country. Next. As a result of these factory farms, these corporate factory farms that have gone into rural areas, I think most of us now realize that our food supply is in the hands of just a few multinationals through a process that's known as vertical integration. Can I bring four, four meat packers control 85% of the feed cattle market. And in the poultry industry, the top five poultry companies produce 60% of the US ready to cook chicken. And in the hog industry, which is almost completely vertically integrated, four major producers including Smithfield, which is owned by the Chinese, Tyson, JBS, which is Brazilian owned, and Hormel control 75% of pork integration. And with the recent pandemic, we have all witnessed the problems associated with our meat supply in the hands of just a few multinationals. Next. In the hog industry, and I'm specifically referring to the hog industry, they've created what I refer to as a pyramid scheme. And one of the reasons I know so much about this is that I noticed a decision that was reported in Minnesota. It was a Minnesota Court of Appeals decision involving a contract grower and an integrator. And I was terribly curious and I, so I could see this decision at the Minnesota Court of Appeals. So I went, then I went over to the Minnesota Supreme Court and the Minnesota Court of Appeals, which are housed over in St. Paul. And I obtained a copy of the trial transcript. So I have a thousand page trial transcript that describes in detail how this scheme works. I also have copies of underlying contracts and a lot of detail about the industry. So what I, so what I have and what I state are accurate because I can back it up. And at the top of the pyramid, you have the multinationals such as Tyson, Hormel, um, JBS, Smithfield. Then in the middle, you have what are called integrators. Those integrators are companies here in Minnesota such as Christensen Farms, Holden Farms, Schwartz Farms, Pipestone Systems, and in Iowa, Iowa Select, and there are others. These integrators own the sows and the baby piglets and the feeder pigs that flow through the feeder operations. And they supply feed and they also supply the veterinary services inside these buildings. You have then at the bottom of the pyramid, contract growers or what we used to call farmers. And those contract growers sign a contract. There is a contract between the integrator and the contract grower. 
there's actually two levels of contracts. So there's that contract between the integrator and the contract grower. And then there's another level of con another level of contracts between the integrator and the multinationals. And that's referred to as the Hormel matrix. But those contracts spell out all of the terms and how this thing works and how the, um, the contract grower gets paid and so forth. Next. In uh, 2020, Environmental Working Group did some work here in Minnesota and they um, determined that they were approximately 23,725 registered feedlots just in the state of Minnesota. That's feedlots of all sizes. Producing manure equivalent to a human population of 95 million people. I mean, that is 17 times our state population. <laughs> 17 times. And Minnesota is now number two in the country in hog production. Uh, producing an estimated 16 million hogs per year. Per year, we're second in the nation after the state of Iowa. Next. And of course, given a manure equivalency of 95 million people, there are some serious problems, I believe, as it relates to manure application. Um, we, our little citizens group did an audit a few years ago in Dodge County to check on the number of manure management plants that were on file, <clears throat> excuse me. These were manure management plans that should have been on file at the time of application when they applied for the conditional use permit. And of the 100 or so um, manure, uh, management plans that should have been on file. There were only 37 on file. So it's a, it's a major problem. There's the manure is typically applied in the fall of each year. The pits are full. Uh, we, have, we have witnessed and uh, the fact that the spreading of the manure frequently occurs on frozen ground. I mean, as for many of you, if you're familiar with farming operations, once you um, you know, clear the, you know, combine your beans and pick your corn, uh, the last thing they do is then they spread manure. And here's a picture of manure spreading activities. And I took this photo in November of 2017. And you can see there are three manure tanker type uh, here. I'm standing on our Northwest 80 when I took this photo, but you can see three manure tankers there's a long auger that extends from the manure tanker out to um, a manure spreader that's in that's on the land, and they and then they uh, send the manure through that pipe that goes into the manure spreader, and then they drag that through the through the land and um, and they inject it into the ground. But a lot of that spreading occurs on frozen ground. It occurs at night. I just happened to be lucky to be home that weekend and was able to catch and take these photos in the middle of the day. There is a horrifying stench when they clear these, when they clean out these pits, because when manure is agitated, um, it releases very dangerous gases, including um, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, methane, and other dangerous gases that are agitated during pump out. And so it's not safe to be there. And the other problem, of course, that I touched on briefly is the self-reporting that occurs by the factory farm operator to the regulators. And so quite honestly, in our experience, no one knows where and no one knows how much manure is being applied to the land. Um, the standard size of these operations is 2,400 hogs per building. And that pit holds an estimated 1.1 million gallons of manure, 1.1 million gallons. It's a staggering number. Next. 
Here's a uh, map of the state of Minnesota. You know, Minnesota is known as the land of 10,000 lights. We proudly display it on our license plates and other places, but I refer to it as the, the land of 4,600 impaired waterways. Next. And do you notice anything suspicious between these two maps? You can see on the right of the location of registered feedlots in the state of Minnesota. Most of our lakes and our beautiful Northern Lakes area is in the Northern part of the state. And then the Southern part of the state is more of the agricultural area. Our farm is in the Southeastern quarter. So in that right uh, bottom, bottom quadrant. So in that right bottom quadrant. And then on the left, this is a, uh, a map that was prepared in connection with a report that the MPCA released in April of 2015. It was the swimmable fishable report. And there is, you can see the bright red on the map showing um, those streams and rivers that fully support swimming and recre recreation. And there's a high number of those streams in, um, you know, uh, streams and rivers that obviously do not meet the standard in Minnesota. There's a, in that big white area, for some reason, that's the Minnesota river shed, watershed in that district. For some reason, um, that watershed wasn't included in this report. And I, I don't know the backstory, but I think it's all political because that's where the Minnesota Pork Producers Association is in that part of the state and the Minnesota Pork Board. Next. Uh, a few years ago, our citizens group worked with the Isaac Walton League to collect water samples. And we collected 498 water samples across the Cedar River watershed. Our farm is actually at the headwaters of the Cedar River that flows south into Austin, Minnesota, which is home to Hormel. And then the Cedar River flows south into Iowa and eventually into the state of, uh, I'm sorry, into the Mississippi River. And the test results indicated that 70% of those water samples indicated the presence of E. coli exceeding health standards. And those numbers jumped five times, 10 times, 20 times after a major rain event. Next. And then in neighboring Goodhue County, which is just north of Dodge County, um, a number of citizens worked with Land Stewardship Project to conduct hydrogen sulfide testing a few years ago. And they created a report called a report on citizens hydrogen sulfide monitoring. And the, um, the health standard in the state of Minnesota is seven parts per billion. And they collected these test results. And what did those test results show? You can see it in the bright red at the bottom, that there were 122 readings over seven parts per billion with readings up to 56.48 parts per billion. Again, staggering numbers. I mean, like eight times, right? Eight times the state standard on the hydrogen sulfide. You can see how dangerous these facilities are. Next. Uh, I think as Zach mentioned in the beginning, my family's been on the front lines for years fighting industrial agriculture. Uh, we've been on the front lines for well over 20 years. Uh, many years ago, we, uh, we faced uh, installation of what was known as Ripley Dairy. Well, Ripley Dairy at the time would have been the largest dairy operation in the state of Minnesota, just a few miles north of our farm. But we've been um, very outspoken and we have faced tremendous harassment and intimidation, including things such as um, blue farm booties that were placed every 100 feet or so from the neighboring swine factory farm to the end of our driveway, a reminder that the, that the industry is large and in charge. 
uh, false telephone calls that are placed by the industry to the sheriff's department, not to report some violation, but to have the sheriff's deputy show up at our farm and try to put the heat on my family and to put the heat on me personally and to try to get me to shut up. Um, they made phone calls to my elderly father. Here was my father in his late 80s would get phone calls from the industry insiders in the middle of the night. Imagine you get a call at two or three in the morning asking you, Lowell, have you changed yet? You know, it's pretty intimidating when you're that age. My brother and I were all working in our field and pulling some weeds out of the bean field. And a few hours later, uh, the stop sign just a few feet away was peppered with bullet holes. Um, I personally have contacted the sheriff's department at least a dozen times for assistance. Actually, I called them, I don't know, a couple of, lose track of time, a month ago, maybe two months ago now. Again, garbage in our ditches. You know, we're, we get constant garbage in our ditches. And this is a kind of nonsense that we have to put up yet. But I tell people, we went to the press, not to grab headlines, but for our own safety. Now, isn't that a hell of a statement to have to make in this country, in this day and age? But that's what's going on. Next. In 2015, we went door to door in my home township to get signatures on a petition to adopt local planning and zoning. Minnesota is one of the states that allows townships to adopt local planning and zoning. And the, there's some benefit to that because you can be more restrictive. So for example, in Dodge County, they have an animal unit cap of 3000 hogs, but at the township level, you can pass a local ordinance that would allow you to restrict the size of these operations. So for example, you could adopt local planning and zoning that would limit uh, the size of an operation to a thousand animal units or 1500 animal units and significantly bring down that number. So we went door to door in 2015 and collected signatures on a petition. And we didn't, you know, it's a small township, 200 some residents. And we only needed a handful of signatures, but we went way over knowing. We knew that these folks were gonna get, uh, that they were gonna be threatened, that their jobs would be threatened, that their businesses would be threatened. And uh, so we took all those signatures to the annual meeting and the town clerk read every single name. And immediately afterward, this is the email that was sent by one of the hog contract growers who doesn't even live in the township. And he sent this to one of the individuals, one of the business people who signed the petition and said, your name was read as one of the people who signed the petition being circulated by the Lowell Tron family. That's my father. The perception from the agriculture community is that by doing so, you as a spokesperson for the local business are against the ag community. Several times it has been mentioned that some people will not buy anything in Blooming Prairie. That's my hometown. I realize it is well within your right to do as you wish. However, it will not be good for the businesses and the community if you lose any further credibility because of this issue. A feedlot battle is not something you should be involved in. This is the kind of subtle harassment, intimidation, threats, and senior, you know, that this is what's going on. And that's why people are afraid to speak out. Next. Here's another example of harassment and intimidation. This was also taken in 2017, the same weekend that I took that picture showing the manure spreading. Um, my husband, we're driving our SUV. You can see our white SUV there. And there's one of the manure takers behind us that tried to run us off the road. And my husband's driving and he was a little panicked. And I said, hang on, 
I took my phone, I stuck it out the window and I took this photo. And afterward, then I went to the Dodge County Sheriff's Department and I obtained a copy of the call for service because within minutes of this call, uh, someone called the Sheriff's Department, but I wasn't quite sure who had made that call. So I, I was gonna make sure I found out. Well, it was the hog farmer and Here's what the, and this is the police report that he files. There are protesters blocking his path down the road. He is not currently on the scene, but states that people are using their vehicles to block the road, refusing to move. I think you can easily see what was happening in this picture. And within minutes after we left, um, I get a call from my, my brother because we went into my hometown of Blooming Prairie to see my mother. She was at the nursing home. My brother said, why is the sheriff's deputy here? So I'm like, oh, oh, I know what happened. So that's the kind of nonsense that's going on. And you, so there, there are ways to find out who's, who's pulling some of this nonsense. Next. Um, as evidenced by this phone call, as evidenced by this organizing uh, you know, meeting, uh, there is a grassroots movement in America, a grassroots movement to stop uh, factory farms. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> it is community versus industry in community after community in rural America. And as we all know, power derives from two sources, from money and the people. And so I'm thrilled that in some jurisdictions, folks are moving and they're pressing for a moratorium on factory farms. Next. Just a few community organizing tips I would share with you. Um, and the key of course, is that we organize to protect those places we love. Our families, our communities, our neighbors, our friends, our rivers, our streams. That's the reason we organize. And we can do so through social media. I would encourage you to create a Facebook page, create a list of publications, assign an individual to write a press release, try to control the message. You know, my, as I mentioned, my folks were involved in three separate lawsuits. I wrote many of the press releases and there was, it was week after week or month after month that my family was in front page of the newspaper, people were sick and tired of reading it, but some people, you know, they followed it, they followed what was going on. And I wrote those press releases to educate and keep the journalists informed. Um, for those of you in the state of Minnesota, this is just more information. There is a, um, something called the Animal Ordinances Web Map that was produced by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. That Animal Ordinances web map was actually created for the industry, but as organizers, you can use it to organize people because it shows the number of the animal, is there an animal unit cap? And believe it or not, there are a number of counties in Minnesota that do not have an animal unit cap. So it's free wheeling. You know, when the industry can come in and put in a great big facility because there's no animal unit cap. Uh, the other thing that that animal ordinances web map does, it shows a list of townships that do and do not have local planning and zoning. So it's like a vacancy sign and it shows um, which areas are open. And, you know, if you're in the dairy industry and you want to build another river view, where can you go? Where's the easiest place to get in where you're not going to face a lot of opposition? Next. Oh, you want to go back one? There you go. Um, a few other organizing tips. So many times, I think, and I think this is where most of us have found ourselves, um, we're always playing defense and we need to play offense. Um, I played girls basketball when I was in high school. I'm tall, but I sat on the bench. I'm not very coordinated. But there's one thing I took away from that, and that is the difference between offense and defense. And so it's important for community organizers 
to play offense, be proactive, don't wait for installation of that factory farm in the neighborhood. Get out there, elect local officials that support your goals of protecting the community from this unwanted development. And get out there and press for adoption of local planning and zoning if your state allows it. And try to control that unwanted development. Um, and the hog industry, they are pressing right now to get into northern Minnesota. Believe it or not, they've just uh, approved a conditional use permit in Becker County, Minnesota, which is in our northern lakes um, area, our beautiful area. And there's something like 200 lakes, over 200 lakes in a 25 mile radius. That's where the industry is trying to put these, put these facilities. Um, and so this is something brand new and they're gonna ruin, they're gonna ruin our beautiful Northern, Northern Minnesota lakes country. Next. Something else to consider uh, if you're going door to door, create a brochure or a card to leave at the door with contact information. You might wanna include um, a website or, or a Facebook page, keep people updated. And you know, wouldn't it be fun if you're out organizing to include the names of perhaps some key citizens or other local groups that support your efforts? Again, a, 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 this is, just you learn kind of the hard way, but I would also suggest go in pairs, never alone if you're going door to door. Uh, again, my home community, we were chased off of places. And so, you know, you gotta, you know, be prepared for pushback and walk away from the conflict. Don't say anything, just leave. And um, these are extremely contentious fights. They're very divisive. And if people will cooperate, try to collect names, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, try to build your network and keep, you know, build all that information. So one final slide next. So one final thought that I'll leave you with. It's the words of wisdom from Dr. Seuss. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And uh, please, uh, everyone, give uh, Sonia a round of applause. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, excellent presentation. I got a few questions. I know I have for everybody. Okay, yeah, uh, I like that. Uh, Sonia, I got some questions, but I encourage other people to put uh, questions in the chat. Um, but the first thing I'm curious about is that, you know, you and your family have been uh, uh, battling these CAFOs for years now. You've used a number of different strategies. You know, you, you told us everything about, uh, you know, uh, citizen water testing and air monitoring, the door-to-door the -door and the, the conversations you had and the petition, uh, taking legal strategy, going to the media and more. I'm wondering if you can tell us, was there a particular strategy or tactic that worked best in your mind or surprisingly well, or was it just a combination of all? What what would you advise us? Um, that's a great question. I, I think you just, you know, I look back on my childhood and I, I think since I was a child, there's one word I think that defines me, and that word is determined. <laughs> so, um, and, and I'm determined. I have a lot of determination, and I think members of my family do too. And I think you just have to be determined and just keep just keep trying whatever it takes. Um, because you've got to, you got to stay top of mind and keep educating. You know, I think that all of this is We've got to educate people about what's happening and the seriousness of this problem. And so I, you know, I guess probably the best advice I can give is just keep educating people. Don't, you know, don't lose. You're going to, you're not going to, you may not win, you know, a battle, but we're here to win the war, right? So just keep, just keep fighting and, 
every day just kind of think about, okay, what can I do today? The other thing I did, by the way, I participated in a factory farm panel, and I think we did that four or five years ago. And it was really interesting because we opened it up to the public. And um, we did our first panel in St. Paul, then we went to Rochester, then to Mankato. Mankato is kind of pig central. And the industry was determined to shut us down. Like they did not want us getting out and getting this message out there. So I'd say use any, use, use everything you've got. Well, th thank you. That's uh that would, that would be my guess is try it all and uh, try it often, you know, but uh, I'm just uh, curious about that. Uh, thank you, Sam, for pulling up the next presentation and, all right. Well, uh, thanks. That was a good call, Sam. Always good to refresh a little bit. And uh, Frank, I'm really excited. And, and thank you, Sonia, again for the presentation, for sticking around. Uh, as you can tell, there's got some more questions uh, on our mind about that, but uh, maybe some of them will get answered uh, with Frank's uh, presentation or, or give some a little color uh, to some of the the ways we can develop a campaign to stop CAFOs in our area. And uh, Frank, I mentioned you have years of experience in grassroots organizing and been with the Dakota Rural uh, Action for a number of years. But is there anything uh, that you want to say about yourself or about your experience that uh, might be helpful and curious how you got to doing what you've been doing? So um, my family farms and settled. So first of all, my name is Frank James. I use a he, him pronouns. Uh, and my family um, settled in farms in Northeastern South Dakota in Day County. And, uh, you know, I live in and my family settled on the homelands of the Oshete Sequoian, uh, the Seven Council Fires, the Great Sioux Nation, specifically the, the Dakota people. And, um, you know, I think that's important to keep in mind when we're doing this that that you know that that has been happening we were a part of it and so i just want to claim that but really what got me into it was growing up on the farm in the 80s and seeing uh the destruction of the family farm system um and seeing uh you know federal and state leadership basically looking at the way that my family has made their life and my neighbors have made their life and saying, there is no value here. We need to change this in order to gather the value um, from this resource, this land that you now control, we need to change that. So it's similar to what the US uh, government and through the settlers and the Homestead Act and the Dawes Act did uh, to, to our native allies. And I think that's that's what really I've learned about this and, and what brought me to organizing. Campaign planning is a tool. Um, and this is the tool, this is the outline of a campaign plan that I've used and that I was trained on a long time ago. There are a lot of other tools around that are campaign plans. I think the important parts of this, the most important part of this is the first couple of bullets here. A campaign plan is something that your organization, that your neighbors, the people involved agree upon. Um, so if you are setting a goal, which we'll get to in a campaign plan, uh, you may walk into that room thinking, oh, everyone agrees on the goal. We, we all just want to stop the CAFO. We don't need to spend time talking about the goal. But really, you do because there may be other goals that people have in mind and it needs to be said out loud it needs to be agreed on and potentially the goal is bigger than just stopping the one kfo as you get into this and then further on down the way it's an agreed upon strategy um i think so when you talked about be on the offense on the offense you need to plan and this is that plan so that you aren't always responding to the next thing that your opposition does, that you have a plan and a strategy that is a pathway to winning and it's a pathway that you control. Um, you know, there are other tools around the campaign plan that can be used and 
And the campaign plan is the beginnings of a prospect of a process of understanding the landscape around the issue you're working on. It's a working document. It's, it's meant to be marked up. It's meant to be changed. It's meant to be updated. It's meant to be thrown out and rewritten and developed over time. It is not anything sacred. It is, however, internal. So only the people who get access to this plan, and it's not something you go out and write a press release out saying, we just did a, did a campaign plan and here's our goals and objectives and this is what we're gonna be working for. That's what a media strategy is for. That's not what your campaign plan is for. I've had groups do that and uh, as a young organizer and I, I, it's important to stress that to people that this is our document. Uh, and it's a good way to uh, spread the work around. It's a good way to like see all the tasks in one place and divide them up amongst everyone. So I think we're ready for the next slide. So we're gonna dive into the elements. A goal, I just talked about the goal and the way I describe a goal is it's a broad statement of what you want that, that everyone can get on board with. Um, it, there are two subsections of goals, one being goals about the issue you're working on and one being organizational goals so that you have some ideas about how you want to grow your power and your organization. So examples of goals are reducing pollution in the Whetstone River, stop mining in the Black Hills, stop biodigesters from being built in the county, build our base and membership, develop strong leadership. You can see there's examples of both types of goal. Um, that I'm gonna do a little bit of of uh, group interaction, at least silent group interaction. And if you wanna take a few minutes while I go on to objectives and write down in the, in the chat about what your goals are, what your organization's goals are for your campaign, share them with everyone. And it's always good to see everyone's goals. But just remember it's simple. It's, it's, uh, it's a broad statement. It doesn't have to be it doesn't have to really be have, anyway, I'll get into all that with the objectives, but if you wanna add those to the chat and share those, that would be great. Um, next slide. Objectives. This is the other part of like setting your, your, uh, setting your, your, your plan of how you measure success. And objectives are steps that reach your goals. They're, they need to be specific, achievable, and measurable. So examples of uh, objectives are to stop the increasing amount of nitrogen pollution from, the, from CAFOs in the Whetstone Valley by the close of 2024. I think I meant 2023. But that's all right. That might be a longer term objective. That's a two year objective. But you can see it's got a closing date. We want to have this accomplished by this time. Um, increase the number of people active on this campaign by 25 in the next three months. To pass the county, zone, county zoning regulations for biodigesters this summer. You might have to talk about when exactly that is, if that's September 1st or August 15th, but it gives you a, a way to measure this. And so if you've thought about your goals, and we have we have a couple people shared a goal. One goal here is from Bill, pass a 12-month moratorium. And this is an objective, Bill. This is good. But so I would say you need to go back and talk about your goal. Pass a 12-month moratorium on CAFO expansion in Pierce County, Wisconsin by July 2023. So that becomes a question that I would have is what's what what's your overall goal? Zach's goal, help Kansas be more environmentally mindful. That's a broad goal. So I went over objectives. If you want to do the same thing with your objectives, type in a few of your objectives about uh, about your goal. And thank you, thank you, Bill, for the example of an objective that, that helped drive that point home. Thank 
Okay, I need to figure out, okay, there we go. So the next part of the campaign plan is deciding who can, who can give you, who can do the thing you're asking in your objective. These are the decision makers. They're specific people. Um, and not every decision, not every objective will have a decision maker. Like for your for your organizations, you may not have a decision maker. Uh, but but that's just something you need to keep in mind. So an example of 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 uh, decision makers are the Grant County Commissioners, and these are actually the Grant Grant County Commissioners in South Dakota. Grant County is the is where the Whetstone flows through and flows into the Minnesota River. And those commissioners are Mary Budkey, Mike Mack, Doug Stengel, William Street, and William Torstenson. And so that gives you an idea of these are the people that we have to convince to do what we ask or have to influence, have to force, whatever word, strong word you want to use, to force people to uh, do the thing that you're you're planning for and your objective, and which reaches to your goal. Um, oh, I should say, uh, you know, this all gets the way we did it in the in the day. It's better to do this in person, and the way we would do it in the day is we would use big paper, and each piece of big paper would have one element of the campaign on it, and you would start with your goal. But inevitably, someone will start talking to decision makers. So the facilitator would make sure to capture those decision maker ideas on that piece of paper. So you don't lose those ideas, even though you're trying to lead people through a process of starting with the goals, talking about the objectives, talking about just like I'm doing here. But, um, but what you need to do is then have that paper, or you know, if you're using electronic means, use electronic means. But have a way for that that paper to be spread around the room so that you can capture all the ideas that come up from everyone. The other thing, going back to the goals and objectives and the decision makers, it's important in the facilitation to make sure that there's buy-in. Like I said, it's you may get strong feelings from the vocal people in the room that these are the decision makers. But it's important for the facilitator to take a take a beat and possibly do a nominal group process with everyone in the room and go around and say, are these the decision makers you would identify? Do you have any others? Same thing with the goal. Is this the goal that you that resonates with you so that everyone gets a chance to buy in, everyone gets to hear everyone's feelings about what is being discussed? Because this is a group decision. So it's important to think about the processes you use to come to a group decision. Actions and activities. Sonia listed a bunch of good actions and activities. And these are the actions and events that will move the decision makers to decide in your favor. Preferably heavily weighted towards actions, events, and activities that your organization controls. Exactly what Sonia was about of being on the offense. You are going to have to have actions and activities that respond to what's happening in the county, you know, uh, application deadlines, hearings, things like that. But you want to have those sandwiched within actions and activities that your organization and controls um, so that your opposition is always responding to what you're doing and you're spending less time responding to what they're doing. So door knocking what Sonia was talking about. That's a very direct way to plan an action that is going to be some, if you go out and talk to 200 people at their door, that's something your opposition is not going to be willing to do. So some examples of actions are have a group of three members meet with each county commissioner individually to clearly explain our demands and reasons. So we control that. Um, have four members attend county commission meetings and speak on our demands during com community comments. So that's not controlled. That's something that you just take advantage of, of 
happening within the decision-making process and you make it your own space. Hold a rally at the July County Commission meeting with 50 people attending. So that's controlled. That's a plan to do something that you control that drives the narrative, that drives the idea that people are very active and interested in this. Uh, so next slide. Potential allies and opponents. <clears throat> These are organizations that may be support supporters of our goals and demands or organizations. <coughs> Pardon me, that may be opponents of our goals and demands. And the reason that we call them potential allies is because actions will tell us if they're really allies or opponents. You can say that, example, the local farmers union uh, chapter is going to be an ally. And you can, you can do something, you can go and ask them to turn people out to an event, but if they fail to do that a couple of times, then they're actually not an ally. They may not be an opponent either, an ally. They're not doing anything for you. So don't waste more time on it. Um, the, the, the list of potential allies and opponents leads directly to activities, like I mentioned, that one of the activities or actions you would take take off of a list of allies is you would have people go talk to those allies with a specific ask. Send this letter to your membership explaining what we're doing. Send out this email to your membership. Come to this event. Turn out 25 people to this event so that we can have a better showing of the community. So those actions become a part of the action plan, but they're specifically related to the, to the allies. On the other side of this, and this is a little more, needs a little more planning, you can plan actions that may throw your opponents off their game. Um, you know, I think that just driving down the road in Sonia's case threw their opponents off their game, wasn't necessarily a planned action, but you could do that. You could plan rolling blockages. Oh, we're just going for a picnic and we're decided to drive down the road at 30 miles an hour. I'm sorry you want to go 75 in your big truck, both on the road. That, but like I say, there's danger in that. Um, and so be very, very careful about planning actions that try and put your opponents off their game. They need to work, they need to not backfire on you, they need to not change the narrative around what you're doing from being from what you're trying to get across in the narrative to potentially something else. So examples are a, a made up group by made up of Friends of the Whetstone. Uh, and of course, Farm Bureau, which appears on all of our opponents list um, from every campaign that I've ever written on ag issues from the beginning of time, beginning of my time, the Farm Bureau appears on the opponents list. If someone has an, an uh, area where their, their local Farm Bureau uh, chapter is actually an ally, good on you. That is fabulous. I've never run across it. So uh, next slide. We're powering through these. So there'll be plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. Research needs. So what happens when you start planning uh, a camp inevitably is someone says, you know what we really need to know is we really need to know this thing before we can plan anything. And if you're not actually thinking about how this process goes and everyone will go, yeah, you're right. We need to know that. That's something we got to know. We got to know that. We can't plan to tie our shoes without knowing that thing. So what do we do about knowing that thing? And then nowadays people start pulling out their phones and Googling that thing and getting the answer to that thing. And it just throws the whole, the whole process out the window. And, but you're there to plan a whole plan, not just do research. Um, and so it's important to say, have a way that you say, you know, that's a good question. Let's write that on our research needs. And we'll assign people to figure this out in the future because that's important. 
the, the danger in research needs are that you're not doing research for research's sake. So there needs to be a connection with the outcome of the research to your campaign plans. There needs to be a, a stated reason why we need to know this, what we're gonna do with it, how it fits into an action, how it fits into you know, uh, potentially something that you can produce that will put pressure on decision maker, makers or move people to, to become involved. So some examples are just how much pollution in the Whetstone River comes from CAFOs. And the next question would be, so what are we gonna do with that? Well, what we're gonna do with that is we're gonna actually do a press release when we learn this, and we're gonna tell everyone that you know, 85% of the pollution in the Whetstone River, which is one of these um, badly polluted rivers, comes from CAFOs. I don't know that number is correct. I'm making stuff up on the fly, just to be clear. Um, what are the other large pollution sources? Because your opponents are going to come and say, "Oh no, it's not CAFOs. It's runoff from your from your uh, your yards. That's where it's all coming from." Well. So you need to know the whole picture potentially. And then another research need is of what are examples of effective county level zoning for biodigesters? Because you know, when you go to the county commission, even they're, if they're interested in regulating biodigesters, they're gonna be asked, so, so what should those regulations be? So as you start planning your campaign, this is a piece of research that people can do. And you can then design and say, who in the room loves to Google things? Who loves to do research? Who loves the library, loves the Dewey Decimal System? And you can set up a team of researchers that their job would be, their one, the way they participate is they go to the library, they go to these places, they go to the universities, and they gather this information. They put this the research report together, and then they start putting it into a format that you can use in a real way in your campaign. The next slide. Resources, similar thing. These are specific things your campaign needs to activate people and influence decision makers. This is another one of these no brainer questions that you, you don't think you need to really address, but it's important to address. So, and it's important to identify if you have it or if you need it. So we have a paper faction. We have that. We just created the last week. It's in good shape. We got a paper faction. We need a website. We don't have a website yet. We got a Facebook page, but I think we really need a website. So you could add Facebook pages to have. We, we uh, need a member supporter prospect list. So that's a little poorly written, but you need, and for this campaign, we need a list of people that we can approach to become members, to get involved, that we can directly ask to do something. Who are those people that may not be in this room right now? Because inevitably you're going to have 10, 10, 8 to 10 to 12 people in the room planning the campaign if you're lucky. But in order to pull off a really grassroots organization, you're going to need hundreds of people active. So you need that list. And if you don't have it, it's a resource that you need. Okay, next, last slide, I think. So the campaign plan is just an element of other tools that we use in like planning and, and managing our campaigns. The one that Sonia mentioned, and it's a, it's a process, is a media messaging and narrative change plan. So you would have another meeting with maybe a different group of people who are really the media mavens in your group, and they're going to design and talk about what your media, what your message is, who your spokespeople are, what the dominant narrative in the community is, and what the narrative is you'd like to change it to. And then they're going to bring that back to the entire planning group and say, this is what we came up with. Everyone cool with it. Buy in. Remember buy in. Um, there, this is not just one group goes out and they're the media people. They're in charge of you got ideas about media. You know, you're not on the committee, so you got nothing to say. That's not the, the way it works. Every, every one of these things comes back to the larger group 
even the people who aren't involved in any part of this, they have a say in this. Because they may have a great contact with, you know, they may, their son and their daughter-in-law may, may write for the New York Times. Who knows? You know, there's a lot of resources in these communities that we just don't know about unless we ask. A fundraising plan, money, always need money. Um, you got to think about what this is going to cost. If you're going to hire attorneys, which is another action. It's not the plan. <laughs> it's an action. So if you hire, it's an expensive action. So if you hire an attorney, it's not just about winning the case because oftentimes, and I'll tell you, I'll tell this story. We have had people sue the county for a writ of mandamus, basically saying they didn't do their job in citing this case. And they won. The county didn't do their job. They violated the process. They that 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 um, permit was null and void. And the next week, the county came back, held another hearing, followed all the rules, gave the or gave the the proposal another permit that stands up. So the lawsuit and all that expense to do the lawsuit bought you a couple weeks or maybe a couple months. It didn't really do what you wanted. So, but if you're gonna if you're gonna have a lawsuit as a part of this, then you're gonna need to have a fundraising plan. A lot of people are using uh, signs, putting signs in yards at the end of driveways, all good, good actions, way to meet people, go walk up to the door and say, would you mind just putting this sign out? What do you think of this? Good way to meet people, see who's with you and who's not. But those cost money. So you need to, as you're thinking through your actions, it, you know, many of those actions are going to have a dollar sign assigned to it. So you need to keep track of that. And you need to figure out a plan of how you're going to raise that money. Um, largely, it's good if it comes from the community. So, and there's there's a whole nother process of talking about how you ask for money and how you raise money in a fast way within your community. A lot of people talk about power analysis. Of, everyone loves a power analysis now. Everyone, boy, if you're campaigning, you better have a power analysis. I would say it's not the first thing you do. A power analysis takes your allies and opponents and your decision makers and maps out where they are in relation to the power structures of the of the community, their own place in it, and then where they where they are like in reference to other power structures, like potentially the Catholic Church or something like that. And it's a good tool. It gives you a picture of what the lay of the land is, and it gives you more. The point is, it gives you more ideas about actions you can do. Um, so if you're running out of things that are working, like your actions aren't working anymore, then maybe do a power analysis. But don't get everyone to sit down and spend three hours on a power analysis right away. The campaign plan, the message development, fundraising, those are the most important things. The other things are in, are like, uh, there's, and REAMP does a good job of this, there's a, a, a mapping, issue mapping, which is another more, more in-depth way of showing how things work and how things change in the relationships between groups and people in the community. You may need that. It's a good tool. I, I, I really, you know, I think that it's something that could be a very important part of a campaign plan. But once again, you're gonna win by going out and doing the things that you've identified as actions that lead to the decision makers making the decision about your objectives that ultimately give you the goal you're looking for. So only spend people's times on these things if you need them. If you've got a good list of actions and they're working, don't say, oh, just take a minute. We got to do a power analysis. Everyone hold back. Don't knock any more doors. Give out any more signs. We've got to do a power analysis. So that's what I'll say about this is all, these are all just tools. And sometimes, you know, you need the bigger hammer. Sometimes the hammer you got is working just fine. So uh, that's what I'll say about these other tools and elements. 
I think that's it for me. Maybe there's one more slide. That's it, Frank. I thought that was the last one. It was yeah, okay. the last one. So I forgot to put a slide in here with my contact information in it. Um, uh, I put it in the chat earlier. I'll do it again here while I turn it back over to Zach and Sam. Yeah. Well, well uh, first, let's uh, uh, thank Frank. Thank you, Frank. Uh, go ahead and show your uh, uh, appreciation. Uh, that's really good. You know, some of that I think happens, you know, we go through some of these things without giving it a little thought and intention. Some of these things might occur naturally, but if we aren't specific, if we're not mindful about the, you know, all that's involved in this and structure, I think um, uh, we could face more trouble um, and and hard lessons learned versus actually making progress. And so I think this is an excellent framework, uh, Frank, for us to, to have success in stopping KFOs or coming up with a proactive solution that we want to develop a campaign uh, plan on. But a quick question to you, Frank, and uh, and Sonia, feel free to, to chime in here. But, uh, you know, if, if you're facing uh, competing goals and objectives at the beginning, if you find that you're not uh, unanimous or don't have consensus on those things, in your experience, is it just best to maybe say, Hey, well, why don't we form this team and you can form that team? Or what do you suggest on competing objectives or goals? Well, you know, I think largely if they're competing, like if someone says we want to stop KFOs and someone says, well, we don't want to stop KFOs, we actually want them. If there's like, if there, if there's, if the most of the room is about stopping capos and then one person about not stopping capos, then you're going to say, Hey buddy, you're in the wrong room, you know, because we're here to stop capos. Right. So that's, that's the way of it. Uh, and then you ask, well, who invited that guy, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but what often happens is you have different variations of the same basic goal and you can have more than one goal. Um, but, what often happens is you start with a goal like stopping KFOs. And then you, as you're talking about it, someone may say, you know, it's more than just KFOs. We actually want the quality of the water to improve, or we actually want to see more farmers in our community rather than fewer. We want to reverse the trend of KFOs. So, you know, one campaign is not going to reach that goal of getting more farmers, but but it gives you an idea. Not KFOs isn't still a goal, but it gives you an idea of what actually your community group wants to see for, for the work they're doing. Good. I hope that helped. Yeah, that, that is helpful. I don't have any secret facilitation skills for like soothing people and getting them all to agree. The blunt yeah. op, blunt instrument. And if someone comes in and say, well, I'm not against it, stopping KFOs. I just want them want them to uh, to charge less for the manure they're spreading or something. And I'm like, you hit the bricks, buddy. You're in the wrong room. <laughs> well, I was going to ask about another topic, and and don't let me uh, hog the the time. We got a we got a little less than ten minutes left in our scheduled presentation, and we'll probably stop the recording at some point but we can uh, maybe go on respect our speakers time of, of course and everyone's evening here but i did want to ask about a topic that came up earlier about uh facing conflict and harassment and intimidation and and uh, sonia if you want to talk a little bit more about how to handle that but frank have you experienced any of that and in any of the campaigns you've worked on? And what would you suggest uh, we can do? Are there groups that can help protect you and your rights or, um, you know, any any tips on that? Your, your group protects you. Intimidation is against one person. So if the group comes together and says, you can't just do that to Sony. We're all in this together. We got her back. Um, and the other part of it is, you know, I think it's an axiom for organizing, but light scatters the rats. So with this, you tell just what Sonia did. You tell the you tell the press, 
this is what these jokers are doing and it's not right. And you, you keep doing that. You keep saying, this is the tactics you're using. They're, they're, they're below board. They suck. It's bad. Um, yeah. I, so an example of this is in Montana. This is an old story, but in Montana, uh, there was a group of picking the windows of people who had a menorah in the window for the holidays and they were scared but what the community did what the churches in the community did is they organized other people and they, they printed it in the paper they printed a menorah in the paper and then other everyone else put a menorah and so you know it was the indication that we stand with our with our friends and families that don't believe the same way the rest of us do Sonia, go ahead. Uh, just a quick comment. So um, we go through our road ditches every spring and we get all kinds of garbage. And so this this spring, like other springs, what I do is I, I take, I have my brother take pictures or I take pictures and I've been putting them up on Facebook. And then last, Last weekend, I actually ran into um, someone who asked me about that post and the pictures that I that I put up. And, and the person said, well, any more garbage in the ditches? And I said, look, it's an annual thing. And you know what? I'm going to put pictures up every every year and the same pictures because I'm going to let the community know what's going on. So I think you've got to be like you've got to just keep putting it out there and um, go public with it. And don't be afraid to go public. Right. And the only other thing I'll mention is there are groups out there that have other strategies for dealing with an intimidation. And Land Stewardship Project just had a successful um, beat, a, a beat, successfully beat an intimidation legal strategy called a slap suit. And uh, that's something that I think a story that we all should be paying attention to because that is an old strategy from our opponents, but it's something that apparently they're interested in bringing back again. Right, yeah, we got some congrats in the chat. Nice. Uh, I, I, oh, go, Sonia, did you wanna jump in? I got a question if, uh, if I may. I was just gonna say, you know, these bullying tactics have been going on for a long time. And, you know, I remember my husband tells the same thing because we're both farm kids, you know, back in the sixties, if you had a farm sign that was for NFO, you know, National Farmers Organization, you know, they started shooting up those signs, you know, back 40, 50 years ago. Um, so that was pretty common in terms of, you know, what's been going on, but it's getting worse. And so, and with these bullying tactics and, you know, you know, what do we teach our children? We teach our children, if someone is bullying you, you tell them the bully. And, and that applies to adults too. You know, someone's bullying you, you tell on those individuals. And then uh, something else I would suggest here is, you know, with these false police reports that they make to the sheriff's department, that's all in Minnesota, you can go in and do what's called a data practices act request. And so that information, you can get it all. And so I've got copies of all these false reports that have been, you know, that some of the hog guys have um, called in. So, you know what? I've got the data. I know who's made the false calls. And so, you know, I'm, I'm here to tell the truth and, and let the world know what's going on. Good advice there. I, I do want to thank everyone for, for uh, staying on the call. Uh, many of you have been on from the very first minute. I really appreciate giving us uh, your time and attention. Uh, it's excellent. I hope to see you again here at the next seminar series. Again, I think that's June 14th, 4 o'clock. That's a Wednesday. And then the, the following Wednesday, same time, uh, same channel. Keep an eye out um, and, uh, and for those uh, Zoom links. But I, I want to go ahead and, uh, and open it up. Um, if people have comments, uh, many of you have been involved in, in so, you know, a care well, uh, about this in one form or another. Sam, did you one have quick, some? One quick yeah. bit of housekeeping here. Um, yeah. So Reamp, uh, the group that is helping uh, sponsor this uh, seminar, 
is uh, putting together also a, a working class campaign, the fundamentals of organizing. And I have put a link up in the chat. It is a five day webinar from July 17th to the 21st, but it does, it offers a more in depth, uh, it offers a, oh, sorry, Eric is saying it's not a reamp event, uh, but reamp is promoting it. <laughs> um, but um, it is fundamentals of organizing. So if you are looking for training, uh, but can't make a travel or can't make a trip somewhere. Uh, this is a web-based organizing tool. So thank you very much for that clarification, Erica. But I wanted to share that with people. Yeah, good, good. Uh, well done, Sam. Thanks for that. Uh, did anyone have any comments or questions they wanted to come off mute and ask or any um emphasis, uh, some some highlight of the program tonight they want to amplify again before we uh, say goodnight to everyone. 